Revenue wise per month is 30 grand. Man, that is that is a risky strategy. I classify my definition of vital it as a block of flats. He's 27, within 18 months, has acquired 325 million worth of assets. Thanks for checking out the podcast. This is From the Ground Up with Alfred Jade. Alfred, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's really good to have you here. You are probably most well known as a HMO property investor. Would you agree? Yeah, I think I've been good at documenting uh, my journey and I think that's kind of uh, given me exposure yeah. to what it is I do. So from that perspective, yes. Okay, so HMOs then. For anyone who's new to my channel, your channel, um, and anything property related, yeah, could you just explain quickly what a HMO actually is? Yeah, so in layman terms, HMOs are in essence a house share. Um, so I mean, you've got a house and you've got multiple rooms. People are sharing the facilities in the property, so the communal areas, kitchen. Um, some obviously might have um, stuff in their rooms, i.e. kitchenettes or en suites. So that's in essence the model. Um, for me, I love the model because I've got more, multiple tenants paying me rent as opposed to single buy to let where it's just one tenant. Um, so for me, that's kind of been my route or journey into property investment. Okay, and how many HMOs do you have in total at the moment? I have eight. Or oh, yeah, eight, eight, eight in total. Okay, fantastic. And across those eight, how much revenue do you bring, do you bring into your business? So, uh, revenue wise per month is thirty grand. Um, and it kind of fluctuates slightly a little bit, but pretty much thirty grand a month um, is what we see month for month okay. um, from the portfolio. Amazing. Now, a lot of people would get into property, and if they were to get eight buy to let single lets, rent yeah. it out to a family, yeah especially with today's interest rates, they won't really make much money. How are you able to make so much money? And, and what is the reason why you actually got into HMOs as opposed to, because a lot of people say, you know, stepping stone is get a buy to that, get a single let property yeah. and then get into HMOs <laughs> and then get into this and then get into that. Yeah. What made you just jump straight into HMOs? Very simply, um, I think if anybody even listening, just kind of reevaluate this. So what is it that you're trying to get out of property? For me, it's very simple in a sense. I understood that one, where I was in life at the time where I was considering investing in property, I was earning five grand a month. So my first instance was how do I place this income? And so for me, it was about how can I be in a property investment strategy that allows me to be able to generate that level of capital per month. And we looked at the strategies that were laid out. Um, for me, another thing that was the qualifying thing for me was I wanted ownership. So I, I wasn't interested in controlling assets or like, lease options rent to rent options that, that, that wasn't something i was interested in i wanted to buy a uh, property so it kind of left in reality two strategies either a single buy to let method or um house share a hmo method and so that was the one that kind of helped me i guess i could see myself fixing the problem of getting to 5k a month yes you can fix the problem of getting to 5k a month through buy to lets but the reality is you can do the numbers on how many properties you need to have to get to uh, 5k a month the numbers are a lot higher um, than um, a HMO route. Yes, HMO has its complications, blah, blah. But ultimately for me, I saw it as, as a faster way or I guess a more, a, a better way to get to my outcome versus trying to go down the buy to let route. Um, and realistically as well, I didn't like the idea of a single tenant paying me rent because occupancy wise, you can go from 100 to zero by a non-paying tenant. Versus on HMO, if I've got six tenants and one stops paying me, I've already dropped down to whatever the percentage is, 80%, 90% occupancy. So for me, it's, it's a no-brainer from that perspective. A lot of people talk about mitigating risk in the property space because I think people want to invest and make sure they definitely get a return. Yeah. Interesting the point that you made there because I've heard a lot of people argue don't get into HMOs because they're more risky because you've got more tenants. <laughs> but it's interesting the point that you just made there because actually more tenants actually in some aspects de-risks it because if one person stops paying, you're still getting revenue from, from the asset. Correct. Whereas if you've got a single let family home, if they stop paying, you're done. Exactly. And I think people that made that comment probably aren't well versed or are not knowledgeable enough to make that decision in a sense. Because if you, if you just understood even the rules around being a landlord and how a tenant has more rights than a landlord, i.e. the person that owns the property, the tenant has more rights than you, i.e. access to the property, so if they're a non-paying tenant damaging your property, they can live in your property. The only way you can get them out is through a court system. And that's an unknown of how long it's going to take. It could be six months, 12 months, and 18 costly. months. Exactly. You're the one paying the mortgages. They're damaging your property on top of it as well. 
Um, so it's like, for me, I'm trying to de-risk my income, which is for me having multiple people paying me uh, from a single building. And so that's, so for me, what I, I classify, my definition of buy to let is a block of flats. That's my definition. People might say, okay. how does, what do you mean? I'm like, yeah, because I, I might have single tenants in, those, in, those, um, in that building, but if I've got like, to say 20, 20, 20, 20 uh, apartments in that building, if one person stops paying me, I've still got 19 people that pay me. So it doesn't affect me as if it's just one single building and they're not paying me. And so that's my idea of a buy to let. Yeah. yeah. I know somebody who um, got into the industry, wanted to get into HMOs and didn't have any single lets, n- never got into property before. And they jumped into buying a HMO. They were planning on buying, I think it was like, I think they wanted to get 10. Their yeah. goal was to get 10 HMOs. They got two. And I think they were like, Four beds, it's not, yeah, not not huge ones, but not, yeah, not decent, big ones, yeah, but, yeah. But, but but four bed HMOs. They had a nightmare with right. the tenants. They had to install CCTV. There was footage of the tenants trashing the place. It was awful, and and it made me think, man, that is that is a risky strategy. This was years ago, by the yeah, way. This was a, kind yeah. of the first thing I'd heard of HMOs. Yeah, yeah. I thought, man, this is so risky. How how do you? How do you mitigate risk on that front? How do you stop things like that happening? So, so first thing I want to ask you is, was that uh, a property just they just bought as a, a ready going HMO, breaking they, HMO? They bought it. This was a while ago. This was when people were often buying a three bed terraced house. Yeah, making the lounge a bedroom, bedroom, and then putting tenants in. I don't know how legitimate the yeah, 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 yeah. the regs were yeah, on yeah, it, yeah. but it was self managed, and they just put in. I think my my suspicion on it was that they cut costs. It was one of those where we've got a dirt cheap three bed terrace house in a dirt cheap area. We're gonna just do a dirt cheap refurb, yeah, and we're just gonna get the first tenants that we can in. Yeah. So a few things. I'm already hearing problems. I'm ringing the <laughs> alarm bells in my head. Like, so self manage. I I'm like, unless you're a qualified like agent. Letting an agent not knows how to vet tenants, has experience of dealing with tenants because just managing tenants alone is, is a is a whole different skill set. Um, being able to f- select the right type of tenants, are you to vet them correctly to ensure that they're, they're paying tenants and not dam- non non damaging tenants as well of properties. That's you have there, there, there needs to be know how. Um, an average person who just works a job can't, in my opinion, understand how that stuff works without getting someone teaching them or whatever. So if you're going to get HMO and just blindly let anybody that comes in view your property and they had to look great on the day one, came presentable looking and it's like, yeah, I want this room, can I have it? It's 500 pounds. Okay, cool. No worries. When can you move in? Just waiting for a car crash away to happen. Yeah. Um, there is a, there's a reason why lettings agents exist and there's, there's why they've got systems and processes in place because they know what tenants can be like if you get the wrong tenants in. And I'm, I'm a big believer, look, we could all make money today. But can you make money in ten years' time? Can you make money long, like over the long horizon? So it's not just about making money today. And even my agents, I I outsource my um, in terms of laying my properties out to. I'm very like I'm like money. <laughs> this is on your head if you get it wrong. Yeah. Because I because I I want to apply pressure in the sense we don't want non-paying tenants. We don't want tenants that are going to damage the property. So if we have to double check references, we have to double like if we have to go above and beyond referencing checks and standards. Let's do it because the last thing you want is both of us not making money. Mm. And I've got to be able to incentivize them. Like ultimately, if you don't make money off my property, you don't. if I don't make money, you don't make money. So let's get the right type of tenants in and let's ensure that these are tenants that are going to pay us. Uh, we've got backups of ways to be able to get, 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 get touch them, addresses, verify that. And uh, don't just take any address to give us. Like, so all these things need to be done. And if I think the average person can't understand how that works. And likely is you're going to let someone in your property who becomes a problem tenant and now you're the one responsible for the mortgage. You've got to pay it, unfortunately. And there's literally nothing you can do until the courts decide it's time for them to get out of the house. Yeah. Yeah, in the situation I was talking about, there was one tenant in the house that trashed it, that just annoyed every single other tenant so that all of the tenants moved out. That's what happens. And no tenants wanted to move in. So this guy had a house to himself, had trashed the place, and this this the um, owner of the property was losing money every month because he wasn't getting his rent. He had to pay his mortgage. No other tenants were in there. Jesus. So it's, it it sounds like a it sounds like a bit of a it is a bit of a scary story. But as in, there's so many ways you can mitigate that. You've shared some really yeah. good ones there. You invest primarily in Coventry, right? 
Correct. Yeah. Soul in Coventry. Yeah, City Centre specifically as well. City Centre Coventry. Don't touch anywhere else. So you use a letting agent to manage Correct. everything. Yeah. Yeah. Do you use the same one? Yeah. Okay. Or okay, I just kind of twitched over. What were you going to say? Well, I was just wondering. <laughs> no, because I, I know people that go down two approaches. One is because across eight properties, how many rooms is that? I don't know, maybe like 60. 16? 60. 60? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say two, oh, yeah, two, two better. <laughs> <laughs> 60, 60 rooms. Yeah. That's quite a lot. As we're talking about the conversation of risk. Yeah. Do you feel like it is risky keeping it with one agent? Would you not be able to mitigate risk by going with multiple agents? Or is that not really, it's, is that I more headache? It's like, I don't know. It's like if you've got a great, I'm just thinking from a business perspective, if you've got a great marketing team, do you just say, I'm going to do risk it by having two different marketing teams? The mm. answer is no. Agencies are, to me, are, are my marketing of my properties because for us to even make income, they're going to have to be, be good marketers. Yeah. Um, to us to sustain income, they're going to be good selectors of people that they, they, they put into the property. So these are the two qualifying things I'm in essence looking for. Yeah. So if I find someone that's good at doing these two things, why do I need to de risk it? True. True. Um, it's very, very, very simple in, 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 from that perspective. Um, they so, charge about 10%, 15%. So, when you've got a brand and power of building a brand, um, you can leverage your brands. I pay about 7%. 7%. I was yeah. going to say, it might be worth it at 60 units. Yeah. Have you considered taking on staff to manage it? But there's no, no point really if you no. get such a good rate. Um, you again, can be like, fully hands off. There's yeah, no managing I, staff. Or... Managing staff and dealing with that, I don't know, interested. Um, I've got bigger plans and this is not even like worth the time to even try and fix um, employing somebody to manage my tenants yeah it's, it's, i think you could but there's no real gain i think my approach would rather buy an agent buy an agent uh, buy a company a letting company that i want to buy and i get both sides they can manage my properties and then I can, they can obviously get other landlords properties and scale that that's there's more money in that for me um than there would be me hiring somebody in-house to manage my set of properties and, and um, how are you spending how, how are you spending your days at the moment are you still looking to build up your portfolio is that the focus at the moment or are you kind of dipping into other things i know we spoke last time about your interest in expanding away from property and more yeah. into the business space yeah what, what are you doing at the moment i think my days kind of vary um like so currently we've just recently finished a commercial to resi scheme my first ever commercial to resi scheme and it wasn't even by well by choice i guess because i've made a decision to do it but um, it was just because it was close to my eight bed HMO and I knew the area performs really well and I wanted to get planned on, on the asset and I knew, okay, if neighboring properties I've got flats, they're not, they're not trying to complicate it by trying to have the standalone property that has a HMO in there. Um, so I went down the route of doing flats. So did that, that was four, there was two two bedroom flats and two one bedroom flats. Finished that and just recently started a six bedroom HMO conversion as well. So that's what currently got in the pipeline at the moment. There's nothing else planned after that. Um, I haven't seen anything that I'm, I'm wanting to buy. Um, I'm still keeping my eyes open, but it's not, I would say, my day to day. I'm trying to find my next deal. It's kind of if the opportunity comes and falls on my lap, I'll, I'll execute, i.e., raise capital, mm. allocate to that deal and let it run in the background. But um, more day to day, I'm, I'm actually spending a lot of time learning. And people might find this a bit strange. I'm always learning, um, whether it's through having a coach, mentor, going into masterminds, um, getting around bigger people. I think for me, I want to understand the game of business as a as an overall, as opposed to kind of being fixated on just property and property development. Uh, I don't class myself as a property developer. I see myself as an investor as opposed to a developer. I have no interest in, in managing tenants. I have no interest in doing build work. I have no interest in um, like just doing a lot of legwork stuff, which isn't really bringing value to the business. Um, when I see business from a property angle, I look at what do I see as the high value skills in, in property business. And for me, it's being able to find good deals and raising capital mm. those are the two areas i focus on in my property business um obviously i've got the educational side as well which i run um so that's obviously something i'm scaling as well in the background and the bigger plan in, in the property space is to try and kind of replicate what americans are doing out in the us which is kind of buying these income producing assets and in essence becoming a fund a fund manager i kind of see myself as a fund manager now but long-term scaling my skill set of being able to raise capital and allocating that money onto deals yeah and that's kind of the bigger plan like how do i buy a hundred unit building and work on that game plan out and building a team around that to help me build out that vision so that's kind of my my future plan mm -hmm. uh, in property at the moment i like hmos i'll still do it like the good 
a thousand five pound two thousand pounds a month from the asset um but i can spend my time building another 500k asset base um or spend even two years and land even one deal of 50 million pound asset i think i'd rather play the game of the long term because i'm in a position where i'm fortunate enough to not need to make an extra 100 a thousand five a month from my asset um i'd rather make 100 grand a month from my next asset I purchase than a thousand five so that's kind of the I guess what I'm valuing now if I look at time in comparison as well because again I'm being exposed to people that are spending less time acquiring big assets or even the same time I met a guy put in context in the US 27 year old I know people going to say extreme but I'm just looking at data what's the data around me it might sound extreme to you but for me it's like I'm seeing more and more people doing this and he's 27 within 18 months has acquired 325 million pound or dollars um worth of assets these are hotels commercial properties in the u.s in 18 months i'm like it took me three years to build a four million pound portfolio he's done i don't know what, what, what x i don't know what x that is um pretty much 100x um on what i've done in, in pretty much half the time and i think there is a point in time where that comes relevant and i think once you've got foundation which i feel like i have i can spend another three years building, building pretty much a similar maybe three x what i do in the last three years um i can do in the next three years but where can i spend my time where the return is so significant it's it's so big that i'm wa- I'm, wa- I'm wanting to wake up every day to do it mm. I, I, don't, I don't know if i can say that for hmo and scaling and, and yeah. getting to 20 30 50 i don't know i can't i don't think i can truly say that i think i can truly say i'll be excited to own a building that's a landmark in a city center manchester birmingham london that for me it's like that excites me yeah and that's kind of my game plan and what i'm driving towards now just before we carry on i wanted to quickly let you know that i help people across the world invest in uk property i find secure and project manage investments from start to finish for anybody that is serious about getting involved in property if you want to get access to these deals and get emails directly to your inbox with these property deals then sign up completely for free on the link in the description. I was going to say, when you started talking about the conversion that you were doing and saying that you kind of just waiting, keeping your eyes open, seeing what deals are, are available. Yeah, yeah. You scaled up the first, like you said, £4 million worth of your portfolio yeah. in three years. That's yeah. quite an aggressive is, yeah, yeah. Um, scaling of a portfolio. Yeah. And I was about to say, when you mentioned it, do you feel like you're kind of able to take a seat now, back, kind of a back step and say, right i don't need this anymore i've got the income i've got the the the, the salary that's coming in from my yeah. properties yeah. I, I can live a great life and it's now just a case of cherry picking really good opportunities and going for them as and when they appear as opposed to like hunting down laser focused as many hmos as you can you can kind of take a step back and go yeah let's look at some commercial stuff let's look at some stuff in america and is, do you feel like that's where you're, yeah, kind of, you're at yeah. the moment? And, and that was the whole purpose i feel like you've got to like the vehicle of hmo hmo is not the end all for me like that was just for me that's that's fun I mean, people might say it's a bit crazy as well to say that's a foundation like you've built a million pound portfolio 30 grand a month that's foundation like what that's like i'm set in my life if i get if i get to that for example yeah. but i guess i've just been into bigger rooms been exposed to more so it's like my lens has been widened and i'm like okay i can do more and I want to do more. So yeah, there's no, there's no right or wrong. I think for me, it's obviously what I've got to has allowed me, like you said, to be able to think. And now like, I really value time and kind of just headspace. Like right now, I'll pay any money for headspace. Like if I could not have to think about something, like someone can delegate this task to somebody else to think about it, solve the problem, great. Here's your feet, take your feet. Let me focus on, on the longer term vision. Let me focus on, on the bigger outcome then try and th- be in the nitty gritty of stuff and, mm. and be worried about stuff like my Hoover's um being broken and need replacing in, in a property like i'm like hey, i don't, I don't want to see an email yeah. i don't want to see email but i'm not saying that it's not an arrogant thing there's more of a positioning thing in terms of i can spend my time fixing type of problems or fix a bigger picture problem which has a better outcome mm. and just employ someone to help me fix that problem and let me empower someone to be able to earn, earn as well so for me i see a fair exchange from that perspective so yeah for sure being in this position allows me to kind of now kind of sit back reevaluate where do i want to go next what's the next big move what's the thing that i i'll wake up to like out of bed like, i'll be honest i'm not gonna wake out of bed to see a hr but like i couldn't care less like mm. i can like call my builders george please um this guy messaged me saying this property is available 
you mind going around and having a look let me know what you think like we've done enough projects for me to trust them i travel the world i'm going to dubai for a month like i don't have to be in my business um day to day to for it to work i can i'm going for a conversion i've been away for a week just come back i'm going away again for a month and all because i built that foundation and the hmo has allowed me to be able to have the luxury of being able to do these things yeah and i guess what's around this foundation is a team because if i don't have my build team my maintenance guys my cleaners um, my lettings agents i will be the one running around fixing all these problems that to my team are currently fixing for me and they get rewarded by a fair exchange yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> do so. you um where in america are you looking because i i was having a conversation with a, a friend of mine and we were looking at some stuff out in america Look, yeah very it sounds like a very similar thing there's so many disused motels yeah. and that sort of thing converting them into blocks of apartments that sort of thing de- redeveloping lots of and there's so much land as well there like is development opportunities out there are amazing so what what kind of things so you looking i at? think with the us when i go travel to us i more look at it from a, a learning point i don't necessarily know if i'll do stuff in the us i okay. i do want to replicate what they're doing in the us in the uk because i feel like not necessarily ahead of the game but in terms of like the average individual trying to step into that space I feel like what I'm trying to do next is something that the pension funds do, is what the insurance funds, um, private equity funds do. These these big players who aren't individuals do. And obviously, I'm not going to say I'm going to individually do it. I'm going to build a team. But in essence, I'm going to become a corporation. And for me, the best way to build wealth is look at corporations. Don't look at individuals because individuals build a level of wealth. But if you're trying to amass like, big numbers, you've got to look at corporations, how they move, what 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 is it they invest into. How do they buy? How do they like when you when you start looking at corporations, you start realizing they're in a game of income. How do we acquire income? Like, what can we do to generate income monthly? Like this, this that's the game, and it's usually through acquisition as well, a leverage. And again, you can't do it on a, on a come up. I think on a come up, you have to do the legwork. Like, trust me, I've done the legwork. <laughs> I've been the busy guy running around doing all the legwork. But once you get to a certain level, for sure, you start to be more more strategic how you move and what you put your time into um but yeah us i don't think because i think there's a lot to learn like if i was to go into the us market again i would leverage my skill set on being able to raise capital and partner up with somebody that's already in the market understands the market is already doing well and the value i can bring to them is money i being able to introduce into my network my brand and be able to tap into that to raise more capital for their deals and scale that because again to be able to scale anything you have to have a proven process um scaling is about being able to um basically add fuel to the fire of something that's already proven to work. Mm-hmm. And once you have something that's proven to work, money is usually the next object to be able to scale it. And if it's through resource, resources, you can get resources through money to be able to pay them. So whichever way you look at it, money is the, the, the thing that allows you to be able to scale your business. And that's what I, I'm looking for. Things that are already proven to work and scaling that through money. You think very big. And, and not a lot of people, like you said, not a lot of people think as big picture as you do i think it's a down to i don't know preconditioned people's mindsets or or whatever it is you've put yourself intentionally yeah. into environments where people are achieving these things yeah. and it's opened your eyes to being able to grow bigger and better and you talk about a hmo portfolio being worth millions and and having a really good income where a lot of people would, would kill to have that and and that being the first step in the journey um, yeah. But to just kind of like bring it back a little bit, what do you think it is about your upbringing and maybe the context that you came from that's yeah. almost like preconditioned you to this way of living, this way of thinking and being able to start and scale a portfolio the way that you did? I think what's always been on my mind is how do I amass wealth? I've always, I've come from a background where we didn't have much. And I got exposed to like the both extremes of, of wealth, the poverty, like actually not having nothing um, to the, the ultra high net worths and what their life looks like. And obviously you look at both of them and we're like, okay, which life would you prefer to have? Yeah. There's only one direction. I'll... You said you were exposed to both in what capacity? What so like in, in terms of, even from like, um, so I was brought up in a place called Ghana, West Africa. And in Ghana, obviously there's high levels of poverty in some certain areas. Obviously, things have developed quite a lot now, but even still, poverty does exist in, in the UK at most places. But I think 
there is a level of extreme in in Ghana in a sense. I keep making the statement, people kind of like, what do you mean? Like, and like the simple things that we take kind of take for granted, internet, having Wi-Fi in our homes, um, even sometimes even simple things like electricity, having light in your home. Um, it's not a guaranteed thing. Like in some places in Africa, like you could be we could having this podcast now, like the light cut, cuts off. If you're on a building where they've got generators, i.e. back up to be able to keep the, ba- the building taken along, there is no power for however long it takes for the government to, to turn it back on. Um, and this is reality of some people. So like you kind of see that. And then obviously growing up um, forever on in the, in the UK after the age of 11 and kind of being, even in Ghana, I've seen wealth again, people are living crazy lives, like more money. There's people, <laughs> the people in Ghana that have more money than people that live in the UK. And people kind of think in the UK they've made it like, and you go to Africa and you're like, Right, this guy has really got a lot of money, successful business owner. Um, and it's seen that as well come into the UK and seen how developed the UK was and like how wealth can look like on the, the average stream. It's like, okay, cool. How do I become a person that has that level of wealth and has this level of control and freedom? Because again, like one thing I realize is when you have wealth, you have control. And I, I want to be in control. It's not it's even be a control freak kind of thing. It's more control from the context of having decisions being able to make decisions having the luxury of doing whatever you want to do like i'm sat here now having a podcast with you i can choose to have this i can choose not to have it like i don't have to be here so it's like having wealth enables you to make decisions and decisions at your you, how you feel what we, we want to do and for me it's like i wanted to get into rooms and environments that expose me to that and again, I didn't really realize that as well, like being ex- trying to get into rooms, like there's sometimes there is a barrier to entry, i.e. you got to pay to get into this room. So it was like, okay, cool, it costs you getting these type of rooms. But ultimately we can complain about the environments we're in and where we, we came from, blah, blah, blah. But if you are trying to get out of your environment, you have to go to new places. And if it means you have to pay, if it means you have to travel seas and leave everybody behind or whatever, if, if the, I guess the outcome is, is significant enough to yourself, you will make that decision, okay, this is what I've got to do to make it happen. And for me, that's, that's in essence what I kind of lean to. Like, it's to get into new environments, I've got to pay. To get access to information, I've got to pay. Fine, it's what it is. More importantly, when I acquire information or get access to these rooms, I've got to be able to utilize this and get something out of it. Because, again, at the beginning, money was very precious to me. Now I just see money as like a, just a vehicle. Like, it's just, it's just a number, um, if I'm being honest. Um, because time is more valuable than money. And I, I can make a point of, like, people can perceive or even make the statement of, Oh, um, uh, they 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 have this scarcity around money, but then time is the most valuable thing on this planet. But it's like, why do we have a scarce? We don't have a scarcity around, around time. People are happy to waste time. Yeah, people have to waste time. But, spend but years. Desperate to not waste money. Yeah, but not. And I'm like, this money. Like, I I just I just say like Google. Like, have you ever, have you actually Googled how much money there is on this planet? Because when you try, even and I used to make the statement of I want to be a billionaire. People are like, why do you be a billionaire? I'm like, well, why not? Because yeah. if I look at what's around us. Like even me amassing a billion pounds is like, it's it's like point zero zero zero. Like the number is so small. It's like it, it's like I'm not even taking anything, <laughs> and we're, the money is only increasing every single year. What's available on the planet? So it's like, why would you not want to amass um, more? Um, so it's just I guess all of this has come from wanting to level up, wanting to get into new rooms, or wanting to find the how, or not even the how, the who. And again, I used to think I need to find the how. And again, a big lesson here. Everyone wants to find the how. The game isn't to find the how. The, the game is to find the who. Who has done the thing that I want to do? They have the how. <laughs> and they're going to teach you the how. So if you want to fast track your way, find the who and they will tell you the how. Or show you the how. As opposed to trying to find the how yourself. Like, cause or, they, people... or they can do the how for you. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Exactly, exactly that too. Um, because people just fixate on the how and like, oh, I need to go... How I need to? How do I? How do I do this on Google? You need to find the person that's done it. I'm just, and unfortunately, yeah, the harsh reality is to find the who generally they value their time, and to get the how out of them, you're gonna have to pay them. And you can either complain, oh, it's too much money. I'm like, it cool, stay where you are. But this is what I did. I sp- I've spent up to this point probably 150, probably more thousand pounds on my personal development, and I'll continue to spend like that kind of money, um, because I know the outcome, because I know who I am as an individual, what I can do with information once I have it. And I guess it's knowing who you are as an individual as well. Um, are you someone that's going to be able to take action on information that's been presented to yourself? And if you're not, I'm sorry, but I don't know what the outcome is for you because 
nothing's going to change um, because if, if you're being provided information and you're not going to do something with information then it's worthless you can't expect a different outcome if you're not going to do nothing with that information if that makes sense wealth wealth creation has come from so very simply not having it and seeing people that have had it and me wanting to be in that position where i have that level of control and i'm going to keep doing that and people call me money hungry or whatever but i'm like the reality is if you want to live on this planet you need money mm. you want to have private health care and not have to wait in the queue with nhs telling you oh we can't do a scan for six weeks out is the next available date and but you're critically in a condition where you need to be seen or examined if you don't have money you can't pay for that private care so i know what i'm doing i know what, I'm, what my focus is if i want to be able to treat my family on a nice vacation it costs money a good trip family trip could be 10 grand 20 grand whatever number you want to put against it if you're not earning that kind of money you can't afford that you can watch from your from your tv maybe people are enjoying themselves having a great time but i don't want to do that i want to put the work in now so i can have a great life in the future and again even the concept of that like people are like oh you sacrifice the youth um you kind of very focused on business getting educated all the stuff and spending money on education and stuff i'm like yeah because i want to have my 30s my 40s have an amazing life being in a position where now i can travel a month and my business is not affected and being in a new environment inspiring environment build new connections have a new network that comes from having money <laughs> so uh, whichever way you want to look at it like the planet you live on needs money to to get into better environments so to look after yourself to live even very simply to live to to be able to walk on this planet how extreme you might think it sounds you need money because tell me how do you how do you drink water <laughs> water i mean argue it's free but it's not free to get a bottle of water you have to pay for it you ain't got money how you how you, how you get a bottle of water you can't and it's an extreme way to look at it but i'm i am quite extreme in my views i guess but ultimately i know i've got to be extreme to be able to take the action to move forward because if you're not extreme and, and think in an extreme way it's not it's not you're not thinking in a way where this is a must it's like oh i want to and this was the wrong society everyone wants to do something but how many people actually make this a must i must do this i must amass this amount of wealth to be able to have the life i want yeah it's good i really like what you were saying about um people seeing money as a scarce thing but neglecting like the reality is people will have or people have the opportunity to have more money in their life than they do time 100 percent so actually what and that's a fact what's the value what yeah the value of time versus money people don't realize that there is a massive discrepancy people will spend their lives the whole time of their life working towards a pension that's going to give them a really low level of cash at the end of their life and it, like actually if it, it's just such a backwards way of thinking because time know, is right? so finite it's, it's the most scarce thing on this planet they're like if you because if you lose a second you can't even a simple thing is this one second and you think we take it for granted and probably don't even think in that context but once the second is gone it's gone there is no gain by that second if i lost a billion pounds i can make back a billion pounds it's been done it's been proven several times over the thing about money you can always make more simple fact you can't make more of time and i guarantee the day someone invents time travel <laughs> there will be a, a long queue of people myself myself included want to travel back time because guess what if i knew what i knew today when i was 10 like 10 years younger jesus christ like because that thing of time is so scarce and unfortunately we can't we don't know how long we're going to be on the planet for how long we're going to live so it's a, it's a ticking time bomb okay so you've you've moved from you grew up in, in ghana did you say yeah, yeah. At, at what age did you move over to the uk 11 11 yeah. okay and what's the kind of context of that and, and your family and like the, the environment that you've actually come from and, gr and grown up in and what, what was life like at home for you? Yeah, so obviously the reason why, so my mum was single mum, I was a single mum, it's complicated, just think, call it single mum. So she was working as a nurse, um, obviously a newborn baby, took me to my grandma in, well, born in the UK, took me to my grandma in Ghana to help raising me until I was of an age where I can kind of, kind of sustain myself and help, help out a bit. Um, where she can still kind of go to work. So at age 11 was kind of my first chance to kind of come back um, and then kind of continue education here in the UK. Um, but again, like we're still in the scarcity mindset of like, oh, making money and getting a good job, getting a good degree, getting, get, do you know what I mean? That was kind of the society norms of what I was being taught. And so like, I wasn't really exposed to, obviously I knew people had money and I've always aspired. I always kind of made a joke to my parents, like 
I want to I want to have wealth young. Like I want to I want to amass wealth. I don't want to I want to live in a better home. I want to not not only have a better a good home, but we, like for me it might sound a bit mad, but like sharing a wall with a neighbor is a strange concept because in Ghana we don't we don't share walls. I can't yeah. I can't hear my neighbors living room whatever I yeah, yeah. like mid terrace like living in the mid terrace house is a strange concept to me. So when I even came and I can hear my neighbors screaming, calling their kid down for dinner or whatever, I'm like I'm like why well, can I hear my neighbors screaming <laughs> in my home? And so, like, I always said, like, my parents, like, oh, I want to live in a detached house. Like, I want to have my own walls. Like, I don't want to hear my neighbours. So, and again, to be able to do that, I realised, okay, to have a detached home in the UK costs a lot more money than if you had a mid-terrace. So it makes sense why people have mid-terrace houses. Because it's cheaper to be able to buy those houses versus if you have the luxury of having a detached home. So if I want to have a detached home, I need to make money and make sure that I have money to be able to buy that. And that's what was always my goal. So my first home was a detached home. I've only ever, ever apart from obviously having the experience of living in my my parents home and be having that scenario is like okay cool i, I don't want to live so i made a joke to my dad at one point and i was like i said why did you guys buy this house like why did you like and he goes yeah because that's what we could afford at the time that's what we can pay for and i'm like i don't want to I, I literally said to him i'm going to make sure i can buy a house without the sheer walls people and and have my like detached house basically and you kind of laughed at me like oh you see when you grow up and you will see and obviously obviously in the end I actually did it so um but for me it's like Get these these kind of events and kind of being exposed to these 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 scenarios, I guess, is what's kind of made me always kind of pull forward, always and always kind of look to okay, how can I get in a position where I'm in a better position? I want I want my kids to have a different life. Um, not so I didn't have a great life. I just I feel like to be fair, my life was was what shaped me to who I am today. Um, and I and I like I valued not having money in terms of like what it was like to not have money and like. I'm I'm very like I'm not like I don't just spend and just throw money away. I'm not wasteful with the word, I guess. Um, because of, I've been in a position where I've had to manage ten pounds, a hundred pounds, whatever. So it's like you having thousands of pounds, tens of thousands of pounds now. It's like I still have that in my identity of, and it's kind of a kind of a, even like way you, when you buy or spend, you're like, oh, right, it's cost a bit more money to. Like I'm still in this mindset of like I wouldn't spend hundreds of pounds on on the top. But I would happily spend twenty five thousand for a mastermind for two days. Yeah, like, yeah. People can't understand, like, but because I'm like, because I see my friend, I saw, I saw him with this Gucci. It was a nice shirt. I said, like, bro, this is a nice shirt. Like, how much you buy it? <laughs> He's like eight hundred pounds. Like, bro, eight hundred pounds. And I'm like, I could, I could easily buy that any day of the week. Like, yeah, yeah. it wouldn't. Even, but I just still can't make sense of it. Yeah. Um. And again, there's no like, return on it. And I guess that's the simple point. Like, I don't see the return on buying a shirt that that costs like. It's, it's still a shirt i just see it as a shirt there's no value add to me it might make me look good might make me feel nice but i'd rather use that money to, to go into new and get exposed to or even have a better experience mm. um have a better memory than just a shirt and so it's like all these things have shaped me in, in some way or form um so like i don't i don't wish i had a different life because i think maybe if i had a different life would i be who i am would i be as, as ambitious would i be hungry if i was born to a wealthy family where my dad was a billionaire i don't know like Quite hard to get up and say I'm gonna go make myself something with myself. Cause like, yeah, I'm rich regardless. I'm gonna inherit what he he's, he has. Um, so do I get up and create a business and I mean go through all the like trials and tribulations of building businesses? I don't know. So like, I I always generally like don't have any regrets. I think my life was planned the way it's supposed to be, and I'm I'm going through life, and what's meant for me is what's meant for me, and it's as simple as that. And I don't really overthink that. Mm. Um, so for me, it's life has been what it is, and I'm grateful for it. Yeah. You said that if you if you were born in a family of billionaires, <laughs> would you be as hungry and everything? But what's the actual I was gonna ask this later, but I just think it's it's apt for what you just said. What is the goal for you and the driving force behind what you do? Because for a lot of people, they can't answer it beyond I wanna create wealth. Okay. Yeah. But it sounds to me, if you were born into a family of, of wealth, yeah, yeah, you say I'm going to make something of myself. Yeah, that's what you said. Yeah, what what do you mean by like make something of yourself? For you, must mean more than the money, then, because if you were born into a family of billionaires, yeah, you'd have supposedly everything you ever wanted yeah. if your goal was to just have the money. Yeah. So what is it that actually is the internal driving force for you? And what do you mean by make something of yourself? I think as a man, it's your duty to 
one be a leader um and like people people say oh yeah they want to retire the concept of retiring i'm like make some money and try retire like Garrett, if you if you have if you have any little i don't know i i just i just for me the the, the, the concept of retiring is a flawed concept in a sense what do you do with your time when you just sit around doing nothing i i feel like i'm not purposeful so what what is life what, what am i living for what to just chill at home be on the beach mm. I, I don't know like there is no purpose to that i would start to itch like what can i do with my time even if it's just helping like just even just not pay it's not even paid work i just like you're gonna want to do something with your time because time really moves slowly when you have nothing to do like just just there's no purpose there's nothing you're just sitting on the beach like it's, hour just seems like a fucking whole day and so or at least for me anyways so for me it's i guess the driving factor has always been i want to feel purpose but i want to feel like i have something i'm aiming for i'm 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 driving for like it's like a, it's like a game um and i, I just i guess I'm, I'm playing this game of of building wealth and for me it's like i can't see the reverse i can't see i'm going to get to a certain point and i've made it and i'm just sitting back because i just don't believe in that concept. i just because i've tried it i tried sitting around and just doing nothing and just doesn't really fulfill me that i'm fulfilled um, i'm not impacting nobody there's nobody like i'm not inspiring anybody like so what am i doing what am i living life for like so i think i will always have that element of i i want more and it's kind of a curse like gift at the same time um because again i understand by by wanting more by even a massive level of wealth the only reason why i've been able to amass a level of wealth is because i've helped thousands if not millions or billions of people be able to amass wealth um so it's actually a rewarding thing and it's actually a fulfilling thing knowing that i've impacted this many people lives mm. and so it's again understanding what it actually means to have wealth but i guess there's always a negative of like oh but you're being greedy but it's not being greedy yeah for me to amass a, mil- a billion a million whatever the number is it means that I've, I've, I've helped embody someone i've helped empower someone I've helped inspire somebody by providing income to families for them to take their families on trips whatever so for me there's, there's power in that um and I, I guess i understand that by having wealth i can do these things and so there is no unfortunate end goal um it's just for me it's becoming the best version of myself being someone who's a leader being an, being an impact to my society my family whatever and that that is it like and whatever that kind of sh- shapes out to be in, in reality don't know but i'm just playing a game of being yeah. the best version of myself i picture it like a race almost that actually in life everyone often thinks that there is a finish line and there's a the, the finish line is like a billion pound a million pound a hundred million whatever it is yeah there's a financial finish line where once you cross no, it great we're done but my question is always like well then what because if you would achieve that quickly and so actually it's got to be about the race rather than the finish line yeah and and so i suppose my question would be if you were born into a wealthy family or if you were just to wake up tomorrow and you were just blessed by somebody with a billion pounds yeah or you just you financially money just wasn't something you had to worry about what would you what would you do for me for example i, I guess there's two things i kind of want to touch on something you mentioned a minute ago so like that finish line of like people think you get this number and you you you're done i think what exposed me to kind of having a different mindset is when i went to grant cardone's uh, mastermind with his exec team so this was like a 25k it was like all in 30k us dollars trip for like two days in in a place called uh los cabos or whatever mexico um and the guys that were in the room were like multi or well, obviously grants billionaire as well but these guys are like had businesses that were doing 50 million 100 million pound a year and their businesses and from from the outside world you'd assume someone of that level of wealth is like they're made their goods they don't need to worry about money but the conversation in the room was how do we do more like grant even said himself the reason why i hosted his mastermind is because i want people who are ambitious like myself who are um, big believers in themselves in terms of what they can produce and he was like, I want billion dollar opportunities in people in the room. So if you've got opportunities where you feel like we can partner up, where we can go to another billion dollar, create a billion dollar vertical, that's what I'm here for. And so he made me realize like, all these guys could easily be on an island, even somewhere chilling on the yacht, whatever. And they're all talking about how could we do more. And so it kind of, kind of made me think, 
if these guys are thinking like this, why does someone who's, I don't know, maybe make, not in the same position as themselves thinking, get to this goal and that's that's it? Because these guys are past that goal potentially you have and they're still on the, on the hamster wheel. I think Gerald, Gerald Glant is his right-hand man, or it's a right-hand man, one of his businesses. Um, he made a point like, there is, this hamster wheel is, is, is there to die. There isn't, there isn't this get out of this jail or whatever you want to call it, rat race, whatever. Um, it's, it's just life, like, I don't know. I don't know what life looks like by just sitting there, waking up, not doing anything. Like, what does that even mean? There's no purpose. Why are you on this planet then? <laughs> um, so, kind of coming to the second question is like, what would you do like, if I had the wealth and all this stuff? I think one thing I've always not understood. I, I understand it, but I don't understand it at the same time. Is why does poverty exist? Because I understand that there's more money on this planet that can go around that can allow everybody to be sustainable and not have poverty. So, I'm like, why does like, like, and I think there will always be an element of different levels of wealth. But what I don't believe in is why is there people that can't even feed themselves, can't have a roof over their head, they're sleeping on the side of the road or outside of a shop. Like, why does that exist? Because that problem can be fixed. But I also understand it takes a lot. It's not just about giving someone money because the concept of people that become lottery winners, they still go broke is because they're, they're not wired, right? I, the money mindset is wrong. They don't understand how money works. So when they come across that level of wealth, they still have the poor money beliefs and therefore are going to get, end up back where they started in the first place. It's just, it's just a matter of time. So even to eradicate poverty is actually more of an educational thing and very similar to like wealth creation or even generational wealth. It's actually a game of education because what allows someone to preserve wealth is education. It's not because we have assets. I can give someone a billion pound assets. If they don't know how to operate or manage it, that billion pound asset is going to go to zero at some point. It's just, it's just a matter of time. Um, so it's, Everything underlining the underlining thing is education. So how do you create something whereby people have the information to understand what it's like to or what it, what you need to be or how you need to think to amass wealth and therefore eradicating poverty? And that's probably like if I if I had nothing to do and like I wanted to just do something, that probably would be the, the focus, I think, personally. Like helping um, helping people, educating people. Yeah, because I feel like there shouldn't be poverty in the planet, like just there's so much resource, so much money. There's no way in hell we should have someone not being able to feed themselves, struggling for shelter. That shouldn't exist as a bare minimum. Yeah. But I think different levels of wealth, that will always be there. Because again, some people want it, some people don't want it. And you can't help everybody that doesn't want it, unfortunately. I hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. If you are, then make sure that you click the subscribe button and the bell notification so you don't miss any uploads. It would mean so much to me personally and also really help us out as a channel. I think there was somebody who, I think they tweeted elon musk or a big organization i don't know who it was it might have been like world health organization or one of these big yeah. um organizations tweeted elon musk and said um it would only cost something i don't know what it was three billion to end world poverty why doesn't one wealthy person do it and he replied saying show me proof of uh, and a breakdown of how I, that I, would I, work of course yeah yeah show me how that would work and i'll, I'll give you the money yeah. today yeah and they obviously got no reply. Yeah, and it's just, it's, it's interesting that so many people think like the answer to ending world poverty or, or helping people money. out of these situations is to just throw money at them no. or throw money at the situation. Or I don't know how they think, because they never answered, how that would break down financially and what that would go into. But it's interesting that you, you were talking about the educational side because it's so true. You can't just give people money and say, now you've got money, you will be fine. Because people don't know how to manage that. Life, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> people don't know how to manage it. People don't know how to. It's all. It's one thing making money, but some people are amazing at making money. They can make a million a year, but then they don't know how to manage it, and so they just they spend a million a year yeah. and they lose it all. Yeah. So it's interesting that you were talking about the the educational side of things. Is that why you have started doing this stuff, going to Dubai and, and training people and, and running your your training company as well? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the educational side, because I, I, like ultimately, I believe like. The reason why I was able to build a portfolio in the first place is because I got educated. I didn't go, I didn't, I, I didn't wake up one day and say I'm not to invest in HMOs. I'm going to go start investing in HMOs. No, I had to, I had to acquire information to be able to start investing and build a portfolio of HMOs. So very similarly, like if you're trying to amass wealth, I just understood that like, again, I guess the exposure came from me and people that have built wealth and can understand how they built their wealth and them saying, yeah, what I did is I, I got, I went and got knowledgeable about the thing I wanted to invest in before going into it. And so, Ultimately, like people obviously see my success and want to kind of learn from me and how I've gone about doing that, and hence naturally the educational side comes in. And the Dubai thing, obviously, people don't, don't know what we're talking about at the moment. 
myself and Tyler Newman, um, we're running our Dubai Mastermind. Um, well, I said we Dubai, we call it Dubai Mastermind at the moment because we run it in Dubai, but we plan to run it in several locations across the, across the world. I guess the the whole ethos around it is one being in an environment where it's empowering, it exposes you to high levels of wealth. And so we want to be in countries where we know there's wealth, there's billionaires that live there, there's people that have super wealth who are kind of again being themselves and just living their lives and being in those environments for me one stretches your mind of what's possible because if you're in some i don't want to kind of name the town but let's call it a town a shitty town where there's nothing that like you don't see a luxury car drive by you don't really see like skyscrapers and, and like amazing architecture buildings that's all you know like you just that's what you perceive to be um but when you get into a new environment where it's like this is like the new norm like it's very normalized to have a rolls royce it's very normalized to live in in the um what's it called Burj Khalifa, whatever, whatever like a luxury yeah. penthouse whatever that that's just your normal world and that's just, just normal day to day you're like damn okay how are these guys figuring out playing at this level how did they get to this point where they can afford this type of stuff and so we we put together this mastermind again because we feel like a lot of property investors or property developers, let's say, um, are so fixated on the investment side of the business and aren't even thinking about being business people. Like they're being busy fools doing certain things, activities in their businesses and aren't actually building a business, building a job. And I'm like, well, you talk about having financial freedom and financial freedom, freedom does not come by having a job. It comes by creating a business. And so we've created a network, I guess, so this, this environment whereby we're transforming people's minds and, and the mindsets of what it takes to operate at a higher level from health and performance to creating a cash flow business to raising capital creating a personal brand the importance of that um even like just just like breaking our limiting beliefs um, around the same concepts so for us it's like we want to empower people and expose them to what is possible if you just get in the right room mm. it's, it can be as simple as just literally just like i put everything i've being able to achieve and and do down to one thing and it's exposure being exposed to what it's like to amass wealth that is it because once i i saw it i couldn't unthink it i couldn't like once you make 20k 30k 40k a month 50k a million pound a month your world like you my, my, my child won't understand what it's like to earn a 50k job or even like the, the bare minimum they're going to expect to, to make a year it's a million pound. Dad, dad makes that in a day. Why does he, why, why would I go and do a job that's maybe paying me less? Because they've been exposed to that. So it's like, it might sound insane. And again, it used to sound insane. Like, until I go into a room where someone's like, I made 500 grand today. I make 500 grand on a bad day. A million pound a month is, is, is a bad month. And you're like, what? How, how? Like, there was a point in time where I used to think 60 grand a year, I've made it. I, I must be like, I'm good. I can... Then I made it like, okay, this is nowhere near, <laughs> nowhere near what you need in this world. Um, and so it's like exposure is what I, I, I try and, and push everybody to like, just, just, just get exposed. Like just go and just be in, go and inquire what it does take to buy a luxury car. Um, just the financing around it. What, what does it work? How does it, what does it cost to live? I one time Googled, not Googled, I was searching, I was looking at rent and properties. I looked at what's the most expensive property you can rent in the uk i don't know do you want to take a guess what the number is a month you have to pay to do you know what i bet it was like 40 50 grand a month way low bro One hundred ninety-five thousand pounds a month Hundred ninety-five thousand pounds a month wow was the most expensive at the time when i was searching and this was maybe like three months ago and i was like wow like who what did he do? i already know kind of know what he did fully, fully a yeah. saudi prince kick whatever um, can afford to spend that level of money. And again, people might think, how does someone make sense of spending 195K a month on the, where they stay? Mm -hmm. and like, well, if they made 100 million pounds a month, 195 grand is not even, it's like, it's like, it's like you spending 10 pound or a thousand pound on your rent right now. Yeah. Cause you only make what, fake grand a year, you're spending a thousand pound. Who's, who's actually better off? The person that's, that's making 100 million pound a month spending yeah. 950K. Percentage of income. Yeah. Wise. It's like, so it's all perspective and it's like the more you get exposed you start to realize how this board actually works and you, you talked about people's limiting beliefs and then trying to break that down when you go to do these um, yeah, yeah kind of retreat sort of things yeah, yeah what do you find is the most common limiting belief that you think stops people i think 
past experiences in their lives is what is for a lot of people it's what's stopping them moving forward because yeah they know they might know somebody that makes 100k a month for example but that it, it sounds so extreme to them because they have failed in areas of their life even on the simplest things it's even a simple thing of like eating clean um going to the gym daily five times in a week like so they're thinking well if i can't even do these simple tasks who am i to think i can make 100k a month mm. And it's like, you've got to get these, these foundational stuff right because I have to believe like how you do anything is how you do everything. So you can't do the small things. I'm sorry, you can't do the big things. Or even if you, if you, even if you some way get your way to do the big things, it's just a matter of time to come back down and because the foundation is off and it's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not where it needs to be. So generally speaking, it's just your, your, the scarcity comes from I failed in every areas of my life and I can't progress past this. And it's kind of having new belief systems of what's possible. And kind of saying, well, the reason why you failed in this area is because you weren't doing this, or you weren't disciplined, you weren't this person that doesn't that, that doesn't get resourceful, for example. But like being a resourceful person, I don't, how you acquire that skill, I don't, I, I don't know. But is for me that is for a lot of people again what's stopping them from progressing because they can't think of how can I like like the how like like instead of thinking of I can't afford this, you you should be thinking of how can I afford this. Mm. Um, it's like, like even and again, we kind of me and Tyler kind of joke about this. And like sometimes, yes, we're creating a mastermind for um, people to kind of be in these network, but we we're also learning. Like, like we're, we're all students of the game. We're always trying to learn, and so like we learn things just by being around other people and kind of being exposed to again certain worlds and what they do as well. So it's like it's always a learning game. Like, and we don't think we're above everybody or whatever. We're not like people are way above me. Like, so I'm always trying to be a student. I'm always trying to acquire. I'm trying to get around the right people and learn. And for me, that that is like fundamental for me. Just be a student of the game, learn, work on your personal development, um, improve areas of your life. The smallest things compound to become bigger things. Mm-hmm. And that's where you start. Just start with the small things and get them right. And then over time, you'll have the confidence and the belief that you're worthy of that person that earns 100 grand a month or a million pound a month. Because it's, it's, all, it's all possible. Trust yeah. me. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm someone that's come from nothing. And I, I never used, used to think, I, mean, I thought a million pound a month is insane. I, I've met people I've been three and a half a month. I'm like, fuck me, like, how do you, like, h- how? And again, it's like, you don't know what you don't know. And I don't know if you saw that, I drew that pie chart thing of like, what we, what we know or what we think we know and versus yeah, what we yeah, don't know. Yeah, versus what we don't. And for people think, some people think they're like these smart Alex and then they know a lot of things like, just shut up, you don't know nothing. You, 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 your perception of world is, is 1%, if, if they, 0.1% maybe even. Because until you go to somewhere where someone spends a hundred grand in a day, and you're like, okay, <laughs> what's going on over here? Like, you, it's taking how many years to amass that? And this guy has just decided today, hundred grand, don't care, million pound today, spend, don't care. You're like, right, okay, cool. Um, but anyways, for me, fundamentally, get out of your environments, get exposed, um, invest in yourself, level up, um, and can't can't you can't really naturally go wrong so last question just before we wrap it up you're on your deathbed you've lived (laughs) you know what's coming you've lived a long healthy life how do you want people to remember you i I, I don't know um, how i want people to remember me i think people will naturally put certain descriptions to me um i've always been a big thinker um I don't take no for an answer. Like if I if I truly want something, I I go for it all the way. Like they don't pull back. Um, I feel like people will probably say I've, I've had an impact already. Like I want people to kind of yeah, I want to be able to have impact to people. Um, change people's mindsets, perceptions of things. Um, help people get exposed to other areas in life they probably never would have been exposed to. So like there's there's a combination of things, but ultimately I feel like. I just want to have an impact in terms of what I have seen on this planet that being shared through my content, what I put out. Um, I definitely will write an autobiography when I, before my time is up for sure. I'm just sharing everything I've, I've come across, I've learned, whatever. So that I will leave behind. And generally speaking, content is something I'm always a big on. So that will be left behind. People are going to hopefully remember me for time to come. But like, like somebody said, over time, if you look at the centuries over time you're gonna be you're gonna be forgotten it's it's quite hard 
uh, to, to rain this planet after you're gone because um, new things are coming here and there and people want the shiny the next and shiny thing that's available um, but I think I, I will leave an impact regardless um, on this planet for sure some way somehow yeah I think you do leave an impact and I think you will I think um, you already are starting to do that and even just within this conversation and from what I've seen of your journey as an investor as an entrepreneur it's really inspiring I think you I've seen the way because you've spoken at a, a networking event that I ran the, the way that people kind of get around you and your your mindset the way that you think kind of sets a a, a bar for sort of the people and it, it draws certain people in and yeah. then it draws people into this this idea of like there is more I can do more and I think that's something that you do you do really well and I think you'll continue to do it feels like you're almost paving a way for other people to do and to think in a successful way yeah I think one thing I'll end on is like for sure nowadays I, I stopped talking about the house I know this podcast we haven't really talked about mechanics of HMOs and stuff and apologies guys but there's actually a reason behind why I now probably share more of my mindset the way I think because I start to realize what actually moves the needle for a lot of people is their mindset because I can I can sit down I can sit down with you and tell you how to make hundred grand a month, but if your mindset isn't wide right, it doesn't matter the mechanics what I'm teaching you. You're not going to go make it because you're not you're not going to get resourceful. You're not going to do whatever it takes. You're not into personal development. You don't believe in in the value of um, time versus money. Like it, these core principles, like you have to understand this stuff, and you can't get your head around this. Forget amassing amassing wealth. You're just wasting your time. It's just you might be able to luckily build it, get fortunate, but over time you're gonna you're gonna crumble because there is a foundation to, to acquiring wealth and for me it stems from your personal development education and your mindset if you can't get these things in place forget it yeah. um so that's why nowadays i'm very big on like just sharing the way i think and because that's the only way people can kind of i guess understand where i'm coming from and where or how i think so i'll be able to get to where i've got to yeah i think we can like you said we can talk about the mechanics of how yeah. to build a hmo portfolio yeah. how to do that but there's so much content out there anyway really we people need to be exposed to a different way of thinking because if they think differently they can go out and find the information exactly. on how to do stuff and that's where it starts amazing well alfred thank you so much for your time really appreciate you jumping on the podcast and i know that so many people have got loads of value from this so thank Good. you for your time i'm glad i got some value if you enjoyed the show then make sure that you click the subscribe button and also hit the bell notification so you don't miss an upload we're on youtube but we're also on all podcast platforms like spotify and apple podcasts also, don't forget to check out the link in the description if you're interested in finding out more about the property investment education that I provide.